Well, good morning, everyone. And I um, apologize about being a little bit late uh, for this media veil. I, I've been down in um, the SCIF, the classified area, and my role is intelligence chairman. And my opening comments, I want to talk about the, um, the circumstances in Ukraine uh, with Russia. Uh, later today, I'm going to be headed to Munich, Germany, for the International Security Conference, where American, European, and leaders from, frankly, many, many Western democracies are coming together uh, on an annual basis, and this has not been held for the last couple of years because of COVID. And I know the, the primary topic uh, will be uh, the situation in Ukraine. Um, a challenging thing is that we have seen no real de-escalation de efforts by Putin and the Russian forces. Uh, there may have been some forces that have moved around a bit, um, but no indications of de-escalation. Matter of fact, uh, the Russians just today have already tried to kick out uh, the second uh, ranking um, diplomat in the American embassy. Um, and we've seen reports, at least, of uh, Russian shelling potentially into the eastern region of Ukraine, potentially in an effort to get the Ukrainians to react, which would then be the pretext for what could be a major, major Russian invasion that would not be simply limited in the east, but literally, uh, as intelligence has come forward, could in involve capturing Kiev, or Kiev, the four million people, international capital of, of, of Ukraine, historic city uh, that would involve uh, major air attacks, um, ground attacks in terms of tanks and other activities, and obviously uh, challenges around cyber attacks. And I, I want to come back to that in a moment. I do think the administration and, and the West has shown a united front literally over the last few weeks. There's not been a, almost a day that's gone by where there's not been a European or American leader in Kiev uh, meeting with the Ukrainian leadership, or as recently as this week, the German chancellor um, going to Moscow. So this con constant di uh, diplomatic initiatives, I, I call it flooding the zone. Uh, so hopefully not having Russia invade while you've got a, uh, a European leader on the ground in Ukraine. Uh, we've seen as well and continue to see these images of Ukrainians training um, for an insurgency. Uh, I think people assume that the Russian military could overwhelm the Ukrainian military, although we've sent them a lot of defensive weapons, but these images of Ukrainian citizens training so that even if the Russians were to overwhelm the military, that there would be an insurgency uh, that would the Russian troops would pay a heavy toll for, I think is important. And I, I want to particularly commend American and British and other intelligence services because unlike historically where the intelligence community has been reluctant to share information, uh, we've seen over the last few weeks uh, the intelligence community say, hey, if there's going to be a coup, uh, it's not going to be Ukrainian driven, it's going to be Russian driven. The British even outlined who the individual the Russians would put in. And then there was indi intelligence indications that there might have been a video that would have appeared uh, that would have shown dead bodies. They were actually going to be Russian cadavers uh, used for this propaganda video. And I think that put that off. Uh, and we've seen the intelligence community lean forward, even with specific dates. Uh, and luckily, that activity, I believe, has pushed Putin back, at least on a temporary basis. One thing I, d I want to mention before we get into questions on this and obviously a host of other topics is that <clears throat> one of the things I'm particularly concerned about as chair of the Intelligence Committee and as the chair of the Cybersecurity Caucus is the potential effects of a major cyber attack. Uh, we've seen uh, kind of low-level cyber attacks in the last couple of days hitting Ukrainian banks and hitting certain Ukrainian government agencies. My fear is twofold. One, if Russia launches a massive cyber attack, for example, trying to shut down 
Ukrainian power or water systems or other basic infrastructure, because our networks are all intertwined, it's very likely that that kind of attack, once you let that bug out, you can't control it, it could have huge ramifications, for example, in neighboring Poland, which is a NATO nation, and could suddenly raise a whole host of questions that have, up to this date have been hypothetical, uh, but could be the reality of what level of cyber attack constitutes an act of war, which would, in effect, trigger Article 5, which says of, of the NATO treaty, which basically says if you attack any NATO member, there are 30 countries in NATO, other NATO countries have to come to their aid. So we're in a very dangerous territory. And I'd say to, uh, to folks in Virginia and, and um, American businesses, uh, if there is a major cyber attack in Ukraine, um, chances are it will not be constrained by geographic boundaries. Uh, it could affect American businesses and clearly uh, when Putin or if Putin attacks and we launch major economic sanctions against Russia, um, there's a very high probability that Russia could uh, react with cyber attacks against our country. So challenging time. I am proud of the fact that um, the bipartisan leadership of the Senate at, at my instigation uh, put out a statement uh, saying we stand with the people of Ukraine, we stand with NATO, and should Putin attack, uh, there will be uh, the most massive amount of sanctions uh, that our country has ever been able to put forward. So um, I hope and pray uh, that uh, a week from now we could have one of these sessions and, and, and say short term uh, nothing has happened. Uh, but we are still in, in an extraordinarily dangerous week. And again, I hope uh, all the actions of America and the West will weigh on Putin and he won't take this effort, which could be the uh, uh, most dramatic effort uh, in terms of changing boundaries of Europe uh, since the end of the Second World War. So with that as a, a little bit of so somber opening comments, um, I'd be happy to take some questions. I want to remind everyone that we have a very long question queue today, and we'll try to get to everyone as quickly as possible. Senator, our first question is going to be from Natalie Grimm from Gray TV. Senator, nice to uh, hear from you. I wanted to ask uh, about the announcement sanctions would be first as a form of action against Russia. How would Congress make sure that the sanctions, the impact of sanctions, would not hit Americans too hard, especially as we're dealing with inflation? Well, Natalie, there's, there's no way that we can guarantee that if you launch sanctions against Russia, deep economic sanctions against Russian banks, against Russian oligarchs, uh, about not supplying Russia with the absolutely necessary semiconductors, which as we all know, even in our country, we have a shortage of, or we shut down and with our German allies, Nord Stream 2, um, which is the pipeline uh, that ships natural gas to Germany and other uh, European nations, um, we can't guarantee it won't affect America because you know, energy markets are global. If you have a major disruption in energy markets, uh, you could see higher prices uh, in natural gas. You could see higher prices on oil, and that could translate uh, through to the pump. If we launch these sanctions and Russia responds in kind uh, with a cyber attack against American infrastructure. It could further disrupt some of our supply chain so that uh, uh, goods that we're trying to smooth out that supply chain, and we have seen some progress, you know, for example, the, the volume of container vessels coming into the port in Hampton Roads has returned to pre-pandemic levels. It, we actually had some of our, our record numbers of containers coming in. That's a sign that the supply chain's working its way through. But we can't give that assurance. But the alternative, the alternative of giving in to a bully, giving in to a country that is not respecting you know, the international boundaries, giving in to an authori authoritarian state, uh, would encourage, whether it be that kind of Russian aggression, it would encourage potential the Communist Party in China and Xi Jinping taking aggressive actions in Asia. Um, you know, this is the reason why NATO was created uh, back in the post-World War II world, to contain then the Soviet Union and to prevent war and to show a united front. Uh, we can't walk away from that commitment uh, because if we did, it would be um, uh, Ukraine today and Poland tomorrow and the Baltics the day after that. Uh, so this is, a, this is a moment in time where, again, 
I, I hope and pray does not come to pass, uh, but I can't give you the assurance that if this kind of conflict arises, that there wouldn't be uh, negative effects on our economy and on particularly uh, energy prices. Our next question is going to be from Hannah Brand with Nexstar. Hi, Senator. Thanks for taking my question. I know that there's a group of Republican senators who put forth a package of sanctions, some of which would go into effect right now. Is that something you support? And I know there were also talks about a bipartisan group of sanction or a bipartisan proposal for sanctions happening right now. Sure. Has that kind of fallen apart, or is that something you're here, discussing with colleagues? And thanks for the question. Here's the circumstance. You know, we are looking at at potential Russian action that could be imminent, not weeks away, but days away. Now, there is some chance that you know, Putin could pull back some of his forces, but leave them, leave them still menacing Ukraine. So if that's the case, we would, I think we could recalibrate, uh, you know, a week or 10 days from now. But the House is not even in session. You know, I would favor uh, sanctions that were immediate if we gave the president a waiver. I mean, this is a real-time situation, and you don't want to, you know, if, if some diplomatic off-ramp is coming that we could push Putin off so we could avoid this conflict, and yet uh, uh, we passed sanctions that the president didn't have any waiver ability, um, that would be a, a strategic blunder. Um, I would favor waiver uh, ability, whether it been Trump or Biden or Obama or Bush. You've got to give. He is the uh, our our commander in chief has to have those tools in hand. Um, so that's why we move to what we could do this week while the Senate's in session, bipartisan from the Republican and Democratic leadership and the key. Uh, chairman and ranking members of all the national security committees, uh, and that statement went out, I believe, yesterday, and I think that sends the signal, um, because we want our European allies and we want, frankly, Putin to realize that this is not simply the position of the Biden administration. This is the position of the American people and of the bipartisan leadership of the United States Senate. Our next question is going to be from Scott Thuman with Sinclair Broadcasting. Yeah, hi, Senator Warner. Thanks for the time. Quick question for you, if you don't mind. If you can talk about not necessarily what your level of hope is, but realistically, what do you see as the chances for diplomacy to work and avoid war? Um, not hope, but realistically. That's a, that's a bit of a curveball here. Listen, I hope, um, but Putin has laid out demands that he knows we're not ever realistic. The idea that we're suddenly going to reverse the last 20 plus years and kick countries like the Baltic states and, and some Eastern European states out of NATO is a non-starter. The idea that somehow um, you know, NATO is going to give up on its basic premise that any uh, nation um, can try to apply uh, to be a NATO member. I mean, I don't think anybody believes in any time kind of short term that uh, Ukraine's going to be a member of NATO. But the idea that you're going to constrict NATO from having that basic premise, and candidly, the Ukrainians have even put in their constitution in 2016 their aspiration, and again, it's not going to happen overnight, their aspiration uh, to join NATO. Um, if Putin wants an off-ramp, uh, we and our European allies can find him a face-saving off-ramp. But my fear is that you know, here you have an authoritarian leader who's getting very little input, who because of COVID has been even more isolated than normal, who believes that he has a historical obligation in the latter half of his career. He's 69 and while he can technically stay as president until 2036 in Russia, president for life, he's got to know just age-wise um, you know, he can't beat Father Time, so he has this notion that this is his legacy of trying to reunite uh, the former Soviet Union, or at least the Ukrainian portion. So I hope and pray he takes a diplomatic off-ramp, but there's been no current indication of that, and the kind of uh, misinformation, which the Russians have been experts at, remember how many times they tried to amplify divisions 
uh, using uh, internet trolls and using their spy services to try to disrupt American elections and American debate. Uh, but the idea of saying, hey, we're trying to move some forces back when uh, uh, our satellite images and our intelligence shows uh, none of that in reality, um, you know, makes me pause. Again, uh, we'll see, I think, over the coming days. Uh, but um, realistically, uh, he can have that option if he chooses, but uh, we've not seen that choice made so far. Our next question will be from Mitchell Miller with WTOP. Hi, Senator. Thanks for joining us. Another question related to this. If the U.S., uh, if the military invades Ukraine from Russia, what do you think the U.S. and the Allied response should be? And also, touching on your earlier statement related to a cyber attack, what are your concerns there about what an Allied response would be? Great question, Mitchell. First of all, I think we need bold, dramatic economic sanctions. And, you know, this is where we need our allies. Sanctions just for America. We, we have, have trade with Russia that's roughly $27, $28 billion. The Europeans trade with Russia approaches $300 billion. So us cutting off our trade with Russia or cutting it back dramatically won't have the economic punch of the Europeans. Uh, and that's why we've, it's been so important that the Biden administration has brought the Europeans along, rebuilt NATO from where it was with Trump, where he undermined NATO. And that's, not, that's been a hard process. It's literally, literally the last three or four months where we finally got that unity, um, number one. Number two, there are sanctions against their banks. Many of their banks, um, they, they do their settlements in dollars. Uh, rather than in rubles or in, in euros, and we can cut off the access of those banks uh, to the global financial system. I think the economic minister in, in Russia, somebody I hope Putin is listening to, has said Russia could see a 15 to 20 percent decline in their GDP if these sanctions take effect. So the average everyday Russian is going to feel it in a massive way. Vladimir Putin, who's sitting on billions of dollars that uh, he's absconded with, sitting in DACA's that are you know, incredibly luxurious, he's not going to feel the pain. The senior le leaders of the Communist Party in Russia are not going to feel the pain, but the average everyday Russians uh, folks will, and um, uh, that I think will put enormous pressure. In terms of cyber, Mitchell, this is this has always been hypothetical, and I, and I don't want to nerd out too too much here, but. Russia launched a, an attack against Ukraine in 2017 that used one major cyber bug. It was called the NotPetya attack. It disabled a lot of the systems in Ukraine. But because these systems are all interconnected, it ended up shutting down shipping systems around the world. It shut down systems across Europe. It cost American companies tens of billions of dollars. And that was just with, with one bug. Uh, the Russian cyber forces literally have hundreds if not thousands of tools they could unleash, just as America has hundreds if not thousands of tools that we could potentially unleash. Uh, we've, never been, this is, we've never been in this kind of potential state of uh, cyber war. And even if the Russians launch an attack that's geared only at Ukraine, it could have a real effect on adjacent nations. I mean, if, if they turn out the lights in Ukraine, but they also turn out the lights in Poland, and that leads to a crash of a NATO uh, uh, vehicle that got American troops in Poland, that's not a kinetic attack. But if, if there were loss of life, NATO lives, uh, NATO soldier lives, because of a cyber attack in Ukraine that bled into Poland, uh, a lot of these questions about what is an act of war, what, what triggers Article 5, suddenly becomes real. So uh, I think the cyber component here is one, you know, I've been, to, I've been saying for years, we need to have cyber norms. We need to have cyber red lines. We need to make clear that if you try to take down a hospital or a healthcare system, we're going to view that and we're going to go after the bad guys, whether they're cyber criminals or a government. We've not reached that kind of international understanding. And my hope and prayer is we're not thrown in to the reality of making these decisions on the fly um, because, uh, again, pretty uncharted territory. Our next question is from Dominga Murray with WVIR. Dominga? Okay, we're going to move on to Michael Martz with the Richmond Times-Dispatch. Uh, yes, good morning, Senator. Uh, two questions unrelated. 
One is I'd like to hear you uh, um, describe your role as intelligence chairman and the, what your, your mission will be uh, in, at the Munich conference. And in an unrelated matter, uh, you, you've also raised concerns about the lack of a spending bill and the effect on the ability for the infrastructure uh, commitments to flow to the state. Could you address both of those issues? Well, let me take the, the second half first, because it may be you know, the only good news piece of this uh, fairly sober um, uh, media veil. You know, I'm very, very proud of the work, and it's one of the original folks that put together the bipartisan infrastructure bill. Uh, our bipartisan group met with Mitch Landry, who the president had appointed to make sure that uh, we get this money out and it's, it, there's appropriate oversight. Um, we in Virginia have already seen the announcement of potentially hundreds of millions of dollars coming in for bridges. Uh, we know there's going to be literally billions of dollars of additional funding for, for broadband. Um, we've seen some of the rail dollars start to flow. But of the roughly... I think the, the, don't hold me exactly this number, but it's about 250 separate programs in the infrastructure bill. About half of them are new programs where the money, because it's all been signed, will start to flow. About half of those other programs, particularly on things like road funding, would flow through traditional programs that are authorized and appropriated in a traditional spending bill. If we don't go ahead and do a spending bill for this year and instead simply maintain last year's budget, Virginia would lose hundreds of millions of dollars just on roads, as well as the fact that we would lose lots and lots of resources to our defense uh, bases, particularly the Navy, down in Hampton Roads. It would be a disaster. Uh, the good news piece here is that the appropriations committees have reached a, an agreement on top line numbers. They're going to be working over this next week while the, the Congress is out of session. And I think this will be one of the first issues taken up uh, when, when we return. And that's good news for, for Virginia. It's good news for the country. Uh, it's good news to show that uh, you know, our most basic function, how we authorize and appropriate money, uh, will be done in a bipartisan fashion. In terms of my role <clears throat> in, in, at the Munich conference, it'll be to sit down with European parliamentarians. It'll be sit down with, frankly, in probably some classified settings with some of the European intel services uh, to talk about in greater detail what do we do if these cyber incidents bleed into uh, NATO countries that started in Ukraine? What do we do if Russia launches a major cyber attack against Europe or America after we put sanctions in? Uh, to also, frankly, show the flag. There's going to be, I believe, uh, more than a dozen senators and almost all bipartisan, uh, going to Munich. I mean, this is as much a chance for us to show the flag that we've got each other's back and that uh, we're not going to stand idly by while an um, authoritarian regime like Russia tries to reshuffle the deck of what has been a mostly fairly stable Europe for the last 70 years. Our next question will be from Kerry O'Brien with WRIC. Senator, thank you for all of this. It's been very helpful on this topic. I do have a question about the uh, burn pit bill. I know your time is valuable. So uh, that bill, what does it do, and does it go far enough? Here's, here's uh, thank you for asking. This is you know, a, an issue that, uh, again, really important. Virginia, really important across the nation. Three and a half million veterans were exposed to burn pits after 9-11. Um, this is where... Materials are discarded, burned, they get, they get exposed. There may be chemical, environmental, toxic. And uh, we have not done a very complete job on making sure those, those veterans get the health care they deserve. My good friend John Tester, who used, uh, was chairman of the Veterans Committee, uh, navigated a bill that got unanimous support, passed out of the Senate unanimously last, last night. That third of the veterans that were not getting health care are now going to get access to health care that they need through the VA. So important step in the right direction. If we need to do more, we'll come back to do more, but this is something that was long overdue. And we need to recognize that some of the, um, the scars and wounds that our military is exposed to don't show up right away. Uh, it may take years for the effects. We've, we've gone through this same kind of challenge around Agent Orange, for example. 
uh, and I believe it is our solemn obligation to make sure that any veteran that is harmed physically, mentally, or otherwise uh, due to their service in protecting our country, they have a solemn promise from the United States that their health care is going to get taken care of. This legislation will uh, help close that uh, and make sure, particularly those who are the victims of these burn pits, get the health care they need. Our next question will be from Amy Knowles with the Virginia Dogwood. Hey, Senator Warner, thanks for taking our questions. Um, my beat focuses a lot on Virginia families, and I know that you're a father. I'm sure you've had to have these talks before with your kids when they were younger. But for the parents and caregivers that are facing this for the first time, do you have any advice on how to bridge the topic of Ukraine and Russia with our kids when they ask questions? Boy, I mean, that's a, that's a, um, that's a great question. Uh, and... and let me just, let me start with this. You know, I'm a lot older than, than, than most of you um, uh, on this call. And I grew up kind of with the shadow of, of the potential of nuclear war between the United States and the Soviet Union. Uh, I can remember as a kid, um, you know, having uh, drills where we'd hide underneath our desks or go into the hallway. Uh, candidly, I'm not sure if there had been a nuclear attack that that would have done much to uh, prevent harm, but we were all aware and alert that you know, there were two major forces. There were the forces of democracy and there were the forces of communism and authoritarianism represented by the Soviet Union. And I think every kid uh, grew up with that, uh, that overhang. Um, thank God, because we'd had kind of nuclear assured direction, uh, destruction. Both sides knew if we ever launched that kind of war, um, the, the very future of mankind could be at stake. You know, since the, the fall of the Berlin Wall and the fall of the Soviet Union in the early 90s, um, the last 30 plus years, I think most Americans, uh, young people have grown up without that threat, thank God. Um, and there's this question, and I think you know, what, what bothers me right now is uh, we have media figures, uh, this uh, individual, on, uh, I'm not even going to say his name, who's out there spouting Russian propaganda and somehow saying, oh, Putin ought to have the ability to restructure the Soviet Union or have a sphere of influence. Um, it, it is, uh, I could not imagine, you know, growing up that and frankly, there would be neither political party that would ever voice those kind of, those kind of views. Uh, and I'm not saying that this conflict with Ukraine um, is going to spread beyond Ukraine or create ultimate conflict with, uh, with NATO or the U.S., but we have always said that we would defend and stand with our allies. Now, Ukraine is not a member of NATO, uh, but I would say to, to families, you know, you don't want to let a bully beat up kids even if that bully lives two blocks away. Because if he beats up kids two blocks away and he starts a gang then that's going to ultimately start creeping closer and closer to your block and your house and your family, you got to stop a bully in its tracks. And when you say you're going to work together, and it, particularly when that bully uh, has a system that says, you know, no democracy has a system that says, as we've seen in Russia, they are willing to go out and anybody that speaks up against that regime, they've been willing to actually poison Navalny, the Russian opposition figure, and a host of others uh, that believes that its only way to control its people is, is through complete control of the media, no access to the internet in, in terms of freedom of ideas. That is so against who we are as a country. And while we hope and pray that this conflict will not arise, We've got to stand up for our values and principles. And whether that bully is two blocks away, beating up kids you go to school with, or whether that bully uh, is, is trying to uh, diminish the sovereignty and independence of the Ukrainian people, um, that's the way I guess I'd start that conversation. But recognizing that you know, it comes from a different experience point, thank God, that I didn't have to grow up with because we always knew that bully was potentially a, a, uh, uh, an existential threat. Um, I don't think Russia is an existential threat today, but, but it is a, uh, uh, unless, God forbid, we were ever to go down the unspeakable, which I don't believe will come to pass, 
Um, but this is in the interest of, I think, American families everywhere if we stand for any of the principles of um, democracy and a free and open society and uh, the right to have access to freedom of information. Uh, all these things are potentially at stake. Our last question will be from Joe Thomas with WCHV. Senator Warner, thanks for taking our time. I was talking to an economist who said the reason we have to make sure the Soviet Union doesn't get the band back together is this time they would be basically be the same Soviet Union, but also OPEC because of their energy uh, resources. Now, we saw how that impacted Germany's initial decisions to uh, bar any flights to Ukraine over their airspace at first because of their reliance on Russian energy. Uh, should the United States, and you also sit on in the energy subcommittee, uh, be ramping up our energy production to help uh, buttress uh, their impact as well as support our allies? Well, Joe, as you know, um, over the last 30 years under both Democrats and Republican administrations, America has dramatically upticked our energy production in, in terms of traditional oil, gas. Uh, I still believe firmly that nuclear needs to be a, a component part, uh, uh, especially because it's, it is as uh, green energy and climate friendly as any. But we've also developed solar, wind, um, and a host of other renewables. So I am still all of the above in terms of Americans' production, our ability to be energy independent. Um, but what we've also done, Joe, and I think this is really important, because short term, you can't turn off all the gas in, in Germany and immediately put up uh, solar panels to cover that, that shortage. So because we've got strong alliances, we are working with countries in the Middle East. We're even working with countries that aren't part of NATO at all, like Japan, to make sure that if Germany does the right thing, if Russia invades and cuts off Nord Stream 2, that we can provide uh, alternative sources, for example, of natural gas to, to Germany. That happens because of strong alliances. That happens because America is respected around the world. That happens because we now have an administration that treats our allies as friends rather than on a daily basis disrespects them. So I think America is stronger because of that. Uh, and I think uh, uh, we, we also have to be careful, Joe, not only about the Soviet uh, Russia putting the band back together, but you've got this increased collaboration between Russia as an authoritarian regime and China as an authoritarian regime. Um, and uh, again, one of the reasons why strong alliances, not just NATO-based, but in the Middle East, the Abraham Accords, in Asia with Japan and South Korea and Taiwan and Singapore, uh, with our Australian and New Zealand friends, you know, we have, you know, the one thing about China and Russia is uh, they maybe have customers, but they don't have friends. America's got allies and friends around the world, and I think the, those allies and friends, if we end up with Russia going into U Ukraine, and there needs to be a united group of allies to push back against that, and I hope and believe that will happen. One of the reasons I'm going to Munich. Thanks, everybody.